Hello, and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today, it is my great privilege to welcome His Excellency Bishop Moses Costa. Bishop Moses is the Bishop of the Chittagong Diocese in Bangladesh, a country of 170 million, of which 90% are Muslim. To tell us more about the Catholics living in Bangladesh, it's my great privilege to welcome His Excellency Bishop Moses to our program today. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you this morning. Your Excellency, your name is Costa. It's a Portuguese name. How did the Portuguese name come to this part of India? About 400 years ago, the Portuguese uh, traders came and some missionaries came with them. And they came to our area and uh, have a very good history about that. So they started converting people and they gave us this name. We have Costa, we have Rosario, we have Gomez. So all these are given. So if you were to look at the population in Bangladesh, for example, you could trace the Catholic uh, roots by the names of the families. Yes, yes, very much so. But now when you con some new Christians are coming, we don't change their name, yes. title anymore. Now, how long has the Catholic faith been in your family? Because I ask because, in fact, uh, Christians or Catholics make up 0.3% of the total mm -hmm. population. So the Catholic population in this 170 million, um, I suppose, mostly Muslim majority, is very, very small. The church uh, that was built in our area was about 400 years ago. So that says that our uh, faith goes to uh, uh, that 400 years ago. So in your, f your own family, 400 years yes, of yeah. Catholic, you are the bishop of the Chittagong Diocese. Do you have others who are religious in your family? Yeah, we are uh, 10 children in the family, and I'm the youngest one. I have three elder sisters and nuns, a congregation, uh, a local diocese and congregation, and I am uh, the priest and now the bishop. Yeah. Was this a joy for your family? Oh, yeah, it's a great joy, and the uh, and, uh, whole family are very happy about that, yeah. Did you always want to be a priest? Was it always something that you had inside you as a young person? Yes, since my childhood, I was very much involved in, in the church activities. I was altar boys, and I was always attracted uh, by some ideal priest in my parish. And finally, I went to the seminary at the age of maybe 13. So w would you say, was it like a St. Paul moment where you were suddenly the vocation hit you, or was it sort of a gradual understanding that you had a love for, for something special? Yeah, for my case, it was a gradual thing, no? It started, but it was becoming clearer and clearer, so I was happy about that, yeah. Why the name Moses? It seems curious. You grew up with another name, but you came to recognize, recognize another name that you have, Moses, at a later stage. Can you tell us a little bit about the name that you grew up with mm -hmm. as a child and the name Moses? So we, at the time of baptism, we are giving uh, two names. One is a very cultural name, and another is a saint's name. So my name is Montu, the I was called. But then when I went to the seminary, they uh, asked us to use the baptismal name. Then I started to be called by Moses. And when I started reading the Bible, uh, uh, then I began to love this name. It's a beautiful name. and great Moses. And the significance for you as a, why, what is the significance for you today? Uh, that Moses was a great leader and he always uh, tried to follow what the Lord told him to do. Mm -hmm. And as a bishop now, I feel that I'm leader, try to be like him, that I have to listen to the Spirit and see what, why he's guiding me you know, to uh, serve the people. Yeah. 
how do you see your role as a bishop, especially now you are in a in the diocese of Chittagong, which is in the southeast. It's a, if I understand correctly, it's mm -hmm. it's on the Bay of Bengal. It's a port, a port uh, city, mm -hmm. port diocese. How do you see your role as a bishop in this in this yeah. area of of Bangladesh? Uh, I, well, I was bishop already in the north among the tribal people, 15 years. Now I am got transferred about four uh, years ago to this uh, greater diocese. So I have a mixture of uh, Bengali people and all the tribal people. And uh, I could see that the uh, I need to be with the people. I'd like to visit them and then uh, assure them of my presence and God's presence there because these people need a lot of support, moral support, legal support, and uh, that's what I try to offer them. So they, they really look to the church, uh, as, a, as, as you say, as a moral, but also uh, in certain way as a social and, and a political protection. Yes, because uh, people sometimes uh, they need justice. And uh, many people, the poorer section of the people, uh, sometimes they are not treated well and so sometimes I, my visit is helpful that, uh, to them and also to the people, they realize that uh, there is somebody to be with them. What political problems would these people face? I suppose poverty is the great, it's the uh, great issue, but when you speak of social justice or justice, what, is the, what are the challenges that, these, that, these, that your people face? I have a, a big area uh, that is along the border of Myanmar and uh, Mizoram and Tripura, uh, and these people are tribals. There are 13 different tribal groups uh, with their different cultural identities. And quite unique. Yeah. Each one is quite independent, yes. no? Yeah. But they live together, but they speak different language, but they're living very harmoniously. But then uh, there's a pressure from the Bengali people to enter into the hill tracks and try to grab the land and all this. So these people uh, feel helpless now. So, so we need to speak on their behalf now to the government, to the leaders. Of the Just church. to raise the voice and make the people aware, the authorities aware of what's going on. Yes, and also uh, they don't have any legal papers on their land documents. Uh, so we are also helping uh, to, uh, to, to prepare the land rights no. Because they, as tribals, of course, they wouldn't have this concept of private ownership. They would have had a more of a sharing culture. Is yes, that right? Because, but they never have any documents. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But now uh, they need papers to be made, and there is constant request from, from their part. So the church has been trying to offer this service. When we speak about, because poverty is, of course, the big issue in this mm -hmm. particular, you've spoken about the tribals, I suppose it's very much a hand-to-mouth existence. Can you describe for us, what do we, what does poverty mean? How would you describe poverty so that we have an understanding of what, what this might mean on a day-to-day -day level? Well, poverty is not the same all over the country because the, our country is growing economically, earning a lot of money also because of inter multinational companies are there. There are governments, factories, and so the country is earning a lot of money. But then uh, well, some people live in remote areas where in, uh, industrial development is not taking place. So these people are really neglected. They so lack education, they lack health services, and uh, so they are very close to the nature. So sometimes uh, they don't have sufficient food. How would they be? How would they be living? They would be living in in wooden houses, or, for example, how would they? What would a day-to-day -day life of of such a tribal family look like? Would they be, for example, going out and hunting for their food, or how does it how does it look like? No, they they live in a bamboo made huts with a straw roof, so which they need to change every year. Why do they need to change a roof? Because there's a, a lot of rain, and that damage the. So the so rains just replace. wash away the yeah. roofs. So they have to, all it gets rotten. So they need to change the roof. So for their food, they have to go to the empty hills and they will cultivate rice. So they make uh, gardens in the yeah, hills. So, and that's only once a year. So if their crop is good, they have better life. And if some years they don't have, so they suffer. 
So, and uh, with them also the children go. So even if we try to educate the children, uh, the children are not available. Because they're not there for the schools. They're, they're not for the schools and uh, also they live with the, with the families in the, in the culti uh, cultivating area. And uh, the best way to help these children is to bring them to the boarding school. I want to come back to the yes, church yes, services yes. a little bit in a moment, but can you describe also a little bit the religious, when we speak of tribals, it's very much an animist mm -hmm. uh, religious tradition. Can you just give us an idea, what does this mean? Is it a superstition? Are they, are they spirits? If so, what kind of spirits are they? What is their religious expression when we speak about these tribals? Well, these tribals are very close to the Hinduism. So they have all those Hindu festivals they do. But I, I, uh, I sometimes get the idea that they do not understand the whole uh, philosophy behind it. But they imitate the Hindu religion. And in the Hindu, is, uh, Hindu tradition, for example, if, if a particular rock or a particular tree is designated as being holy, it can be venerated? Or how, how would you, uh, how does this work in, in, in this spiritual tradition? I have not seen that they still worship any trees or any, uh, some people, maybe a very limited number, sometimes they, when they see something very big, a big stone in the river, they'll stop and then they touch and then they go. So that kind of belief is there. But um, uh, it's not real uh, animism, but it is, uh, I think, very close to the Hindu culture. The Muslim tradition, the Muslim religion, is the majority in the country. Um, the tribals, as, you, as we've been speaking about, are closer to the Hindu tradition and, and more animist. Are they more open to the Catholic Church? Are they more open to the Catholic faith? Do you find it easier to find conversions among the the, the mm -hmm tribals and the animists than, for example, you would among the Muslim population? Or where do your converts come from? Our converts mainly come from their tribal area, tribal people, because they feel very close to our culture, the Catholic culture. Why? Because we respect each culture and we take into the liturgy, the prayer, like the language and um, all their music and uh, dance and all these things whereas the Islam will be very reluctant to their language because they always pray in Arabic, uh, even if they don't understand. Uh, they also don't use much music. Also, the food is connected with it. How is uh, that? Like uh, some food uh, the Muslims will never eat, like the pork. Pork, for example. So, and the tribal people, that's the best food they have, they enjoy. But when they are not able to do it, so they are naturally attracted to the Catholics. Uh, community and also another big attraction is that the church is always on their side to defend them to speak on their behalf to educate their children and health care so i think this service is connected with their experience of love and experience of god so they are attracted to the christianity in fact many or much criticism has been placed against the missionaries previously as having taking away the local culture. But in this context, particularly I think in Bangladesh and, and other northern parts of India, the tribals, the Catholic Church serves as a protection, as a, as a sort of a guarantor or some kind of protection of the local traditions which are good. How do you try and see what is good in a local culture and then try and protect that? And then at the same time when there are things perhaps not so good, you educate and say, maybe this is something that tribal cultural tradition that can be put aside because it's not healthy for the population or healthy for the individual. The most part of the culture of the tribal culture is acceptable because it's beautiful. No. Yes. And then uh, so uh, there's no difficulty in it. So we respect it. Only problem sometimes we have some cultural uh, practice now. Like for example that the since they don't have they like a we have priests and religious now so they don't have so sometimes a uh, leader of the uh, village will bless the marriage, for example, and he is not authorized to do it. So it is difficult sometimes to accept that also for them to, to adjust to our Catholic um, the laws, you know, church laws and all these things, the sacramental dimension of it. So now they are slowly learning it 
uh, through catechesis and all this. So, if we change a little bit the scope and talk about the relations between the religious traditions, as we spoke about, the Muslims are over ninety percent of the population. How are the relations between the Muslims and the Hindus, and then the Hindus and Muslims? with the Christians, how are, how are the religious relations between the different traditions? Well, uh, Bangladesh is, is, uh, has been known always for um, um, the inter-religious harmony. And uh, we have been living for centuries. The, In peace. The, yeah, the, uh, particularly Hindus, Muslims, and Christians. And Buddhists, uh, they live in a, a certain area of the country. So for religions, they live very harmoniously. So that was never a problem. And they mutually uh, they, uh, invite one another during the big great festivals. Though. So there's no problem. But only recent years, like uh, about 20 years, since 20 years now, so the religious fundamentalism has been growing, started growing very, very strong among the uh, Muslims. Where is this coming from? Uh, we don't know, but we guess it's coming from the support of the Arab countries. It seems Saudi Arabia to, because and they are giving a lot of financial support. Because with the support, they are building mosques and, uh, and Islamic schools, madrasas. Is uh, it this Wahhabist Islam that's coming in, or uh, is it the particular uh, branch of Islam which is becoming more fundamentalist, or no? The, their help is generally given to the government also, and not to the groups. Islamic groups, but I suppose uh, among the groups, there one group we didn't realize it was getting so strong. That is um, Jamaati Islam now we call. So that is getting a lot of money, and they started even uh, banks and even uh, relief organizations now Muslim aid, all these things now. So these are getting a lot of support from. Are you starting to see for the first time, for example, violence uh, between or, or Christians suffering uh, violence as a consequence or at the hands of Muslim extremists? Uh, in some place there are isolated events, but not yet a systematic killing. But is uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, terrorist activities is not only against the minorities, even the among the Muslims, no, different groups. They're fighting each other. Yeah, because there are different schools of Islam. Mm -hmm. But the majority is Sunni, in fact, in yes, Bangladesh. Sunni, but uh, still uh, it's not Sunni Shiite, but there are also different schools. Uh, we have uh, different type of madrasas. So they have different lines of uh, thinking. And so they are, some have anti-religion attitude, some other types of line. But in recent years, like some, they're very fundamental because recently you had, I think, six or seven bloggers were killed already now. And uh, so they For started killing who, uh, they don't uh, see that they speak openly, no. And they were, with these bloggers, I think, were they um, non-believers in the sense that they were not Muslim and they were being critical, or why were these uh, bloggers attack. They are accused of being atheists, no? Atheists. Atheists, or they are talking against Islam, so so they are not tolerated, no. And what about the Catholic Church? Is the, is the Catholic faith growing? And, and how is the growth of the Catholic Church uh, perceived, or is the Church still such a minority that it is not considered, if you, if you will, a threat at all to, to, to the local Islam? I don't think that uh, Christianity is a threat to them because they always ask us to uh, to run schools for them, no? The best schools uh, uh, belong to the Catholic community, the church, and they are product of our schools, or health service, or even development uh, work like Caritas is very well known. But I think what is, it's a, it's a small minority of uh, maybe Muslims, they somehow cannot tolerate the others, no? Hindus or the Christians or, or the Buddhists, no? I'd like to come to the question of the service of the church. You've said that education obviously is, is critical, especially... Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us a little bit of a, a background, if you will? What is the educational situation? Uh, what would be, for example, the percentage of young people that, that are illiterate or or 
Um, if you can give us just a little bit of a background as to the educational situation in the country. Uh, government is very, uh, very particular about uh, uh, promoting good education, uh, quality education. The country has been doing very well. We have universities, we have colleges, we have schools, but uh, there is always a problem of the countryside where more schools are needed. The poor people cannot send their children to the cities, to the towns to study. So I think that part... That That's where the church, the church can church play is a role. Doing, and also some uh, NGOs, now, some non-government organizations, even, even like the uh, European Union is trying to promote that now to the very rural areas. And so you have a school and then you'll have a boarding house. And uh, why the boarding house? It is not in the, in, the, in the developed area. We have very few boardings. But we need boardings in the, in the countryside because we have many scattered villages. Maybe one village will have 20, 30 families. We cannot build a school for, only for this family. There are so many hundreds of them. So it is better that we, some villages can come together and, and they can send their children to the boarding. So it is a better organization now. Uh, so there are more children, there are more interaction, then, and then it is also good, uh, easy to manage. So that's why... And these schools are being run by the sisters? Would that be the, more the responsibility of the sisters, or is it lay people who are also managing this, the uh, Catholic schools? It's all together because most of the uh, boardings are run by the lay people, lay women or men. Sisters are on top of that because they have to go to the villages also for other types of activities. But, uh, but everything is supervised by the priest and the sisters. I'd like to speak very briefly about uh, vocations in the country. Do you see a new generation of young sisters, young priests, and are they coming from the local population or are they still mainly missionary that is coming from abroad? No, no, all our, practically all our <laughs> priests and religious are local. See, they can, the government allows only 300 missionaries to come, and it's becoming uh, difficult each day. So it's restricted it's by restricted, the government, yes. because they don't want too much foreign influence. Uh, that is indirectly what's uh, being communicated, but then I, but also, the, we also would like to depend on ourselves, because uh, we don't know eventually what will happen. But we have a lot of vocations. Our, all our seminaries are full, all our formation houses. Uh, so, but we need to also develop a missionary mind among the local priests and religious so that they can also think of going outside the country also. where To be missionaries needs. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Your Excellency, if you were to say, what or rather, what would be the needs that you would see in your diocese? See, I am constantly uh, moving around the diocese, uh, even remote areas. The, the first thing, the people want education for their children. Uh, they want their children to be taken to the boarding. But uh, we are not able to accommodate them. We cannot also support that they, we have a limited resources. So that is one, uh, we, we see it a very important thing that they want education. Secondly, these are all new Christians. They always, when I go to a village, they said, Bishop, we would like to have a chapel for us. And chapel means it's not only a prayer room, but it, it also helps people to get together. They have meetings and other activities also in the chapel. So these are the uh, needs. And, and many people are also suffering because of uh, lack of health care facilities. In the remote area, there are no doctors, no medicine available. So, and uh, we missionaries would like to bring some medical care to them, bring medicine or in a very simple way. And whenever somebody is very sick, we would like to send them to the cities now for better treatment. So these are the education, healthcare, and, uh, and the pastoral, spiritual care. The spiritual these are needs. our constant needs yes. of the diocese. Yeah. Your Excellency, thank you for having been with yeah. us today in our program. Thank
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, I'm very happy to be a good pleasure thank you. to be with you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today in our program, Where God Weeps. And if you'd like to know more about the work of Bishop Costa in the Chittagong Diocese in Bangladesh, or perhaps how you might even be able to help, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.